Hello, everybody. It's Dean here, and I am joined by the marvelous Anna from Digital Dom. Anna, um, there's, Hi, no, Dean. there's no notes, right? No notes, no. <laughs> so, um, how are you? It's good, and and you're very brave for being on this with no notes. So every time I do an episode, I don't script it. I ask people. I think it comes across as more human when we just talk things through. So Anna, do you want to tell us a bit about what you get up to, what Digital Dom's all about, and then we'll kind of I'm going to grill you. Sure, let's um, let's do that. So um, I've been running Digital Dom for a couple of years now. Uh, Digital Dom is an agile delivery and software development company. Um, so what do we do? We help organisations to speed up their software delivery and development practices. So essentially we try, we help them to get the technology as quickly out the door as possible uh, while optimizing uh, delivery frameworks. Okay. So some people will be going, okay, uh, why, what, what does this, in everybody's digitizing, right? And I think 2020 made everybody digitize even more, but, just land this agile and getting it faster. What what do you see the main problems are with when companies want to digitally transform, as they call it? Well, first of all, transformation means different things to different companies. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's really just understanding where, and if you take an organization, there will be a different steps and different phases of their transformation journey. Some of them are just getting into tech and just realizing that actually uh, we need to digitalize our strategy. Uh, others have been doing it for years, but they understand that actually th th there is a lot more optimization we can do because that's that's essentially what it's all about. Uh, optimizing, you, you can never be agile enough, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so there's loads. Um, is, it a, is it a bit like a website, right? And uh, apologies if I'm kind of demeaning your profession, but is it is it a bit like a website? You finish the website, and then, of course, the world moves on. And now, immediately, as soon as the website's out of date, technology improves, the way people behave changes. So the world's constantly spinning. And you go, we're going to build this. And we launch it on day one. And then, of course, three months down the line, there's new innovation. So when we're talking about agile, are we talking about and transformation? Are we talking about setting ourselves up so that we can keep pace? Or are we talking about coming from the dark ages to a modern time? How do you see the two? It can be it can be um, both. Uh, but what we're trying to do, so the traditional way of working is you think of an idea, of a concept, you build it, you invest your resources in it, then you launch it, and then you figure out whether that's what your customers want. Mm -hmm. um, so in my view, um, what we are looking to gain from all of this is build experimentation um, into your into your ways of working. So whether that's you think you know at the strategy level, I want to go into a new market or launch a new feature or launch a new product, um, you should be asking yourself, how can I get this in from in front of the customers as soon as possible? Mm -hmm. um, and like like beta testing almost beta testing in the market beta testing a b testing it can get you can get a prototype a prototype up fairly quickly get this in front of the customers get feedback because there's two, any organization there's there's two uh answer there's just two questions that should be on your mind and that's am i delivering value by building this to my customers mm -hmm. and what is the channel that i can reach my customers mm -hmm. So those questions, you should be aiming at answering those questions before you invest any money and 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 time into building a fully fledged solution. Mm -hmm. So when I when I hear the word transformation, what it means to me is that you set up your business in a way that you can do that, that you spend your money in the most efficient way on the mo on the best ideas that are actually needed by your customers. Mm -hmm. And talking about spending money, uh, I'll tell you a story. And I don't know how common this is, but I see a lot of, you know, when you you buy a new car and then you see lots of people with the same car. You ever seen that? You get a new car and then suddenly yeah, you see the same car on the road. Yeah. 
So a few years ago, I was working with a client and they were spending hundreds of thousands of pounds, hundreds of thousands of pounds on building their own CRM. Yeah. I'm not joking, right? The developer who was building it drove a Rolls Royce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a true story. Yeah. Right. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds went on this software. And when it was launched after all of this investment, it still didn't quite work as anticipated. Yeah. It still needed more stuff doing to it. No, and, absolutely. Uh, Sorry. Go on. Uh, this is a classic example. I mean, I've got a few of those in, in, in the bag on projects that I've actually worked on. Um, one of the more recent one was, and the biggest uh, one was with EasyJet. I mean, they were working on a product uh, for three years without launching a single code, a piece of code into production, wow. only to realize that actually in those three years, market has moved on. <laughs> um, so yeah, <laughs> lots of it. And, and that was on the large scale. There's, I was also working with a pharmaceutical client, uh, very similar. They knew that uh, they wanted a B2B platform for their customers launched. And, you know, they went with a well-known ERP system. Uh, called Oracle, so they've chosen a module, an e-commerce module, module, and then they build this, customi customized it, configured it, launched it, and they had about, you know, spent obviously considerable amounts of money on it, and they had about a, a thousand quid in sales uh, per week. I mean, <laughs> it would take them quite a few years to get your return on investment. So, and the problem with this is that they had an idea and they had a they 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 thought they knew what the customer wanted and they didn't test it and they launched it and then actually that's not what what the user wants that's not what the customer wants so it's it's about um it's it's about not doing that not making that mistake and figuring out how is it that on a large scale so with with small with startup businesses it's a little bit easier to do uh, but when you're already used to working and you're a big organization how do you actually move from a traditional operational model to something that um, uh, encourages and uh, enables this experimentation mm -hmm. so so when a company's looking at this stuff it's almost like blinkers that are on their thinking um, it's not necessarily about expertise in software and stuff like that. It's blinkers on the thought processes or the strategy behind the from idea to uh, launch. It's often not the. It's not. I have to hear me right here. It's not the the technology that lets them down. It's how they've deployed the technology from the strategy. And. Whenever I talk to hear people talking about digital transformation, it always gets kind of landlocked into techie stuff. Yeah, that's, you're absolutely right, because people wrongly assume that uh, if we spend a lot of money on tech, surely that's going to give us a return on investment. But there is a couple of issues with that. Um, uh, your, you, you know, the people internally uh, are maybe not used to this tech or your customers don't, uh, is not, isn't, it's not the kind of tech that they need. So people think transformation equals technology, but it doesn't matter how much money you spend on technology and whether that's the best ERP systems in class or whether that's, you know, the best uh, modern tech stack there is out there. Um, that's not what's going to transform your business. Mm -hmm. No, it's the strategy behind it to go, well, actually, you know, I can I can dump this big piece of tech in there, but actually, if it doesn't it doesn't eliminate bureaucracy, if it doesn't help the organisation be more efficient, if it doesn't improve customer experience, if it doesn't create revenue, it's useless, right? Um, it's yes, it's it's not tech. It's about that transition. So again, it depends where you are in the transformation phase. Um, and how you adapt it. So um, what really works is uh, what we apply in, in Digital Dome is work in small batches and experiment and test and get the data, understand and iterate. Maybe you know what your customers uh, uh, want, but it's going to take you a little bit longer 
but going a little bit slower and getting the buy-in from all the angles, that's going to ensure that your transformation is going to mm -hmm. be sustainable. Just throwing loads of money at it, um, doing it as quickly as possible um, and launching as a big bang, then only to realize nobody knows how to use it and do we even need it. That's that's uh, one of the biggest mistakes we, we, we see organizations mm -hmm. actually make. So how do organizations where they know that they're doing things in a particular way, you know, and I'm not thinking just about technology here, but I'm thinking more about how do they work to solve some of the problems? I'll give you an example. We've just had a meeting today here about, you know, um, over time you get kind of like tech fat, <laughs> that's what i called it today which is basically you got this gadget and this gadget and this gadget and this gadget and suddenly all these gadgets that are there to help you become a an encumbrance they 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 add complexity and we've just spent a, a time going how can we get rid of some of the tech yeah how can we how can we get rid of some of it how can we make our lives easier um but how, as a business evolves, complexity comes in and it creates new problems. How does a business solve problems like that where it's it's ingrained because this tech and this tech? How do you get a culture of elimination of unnecessary issue, unnecessary stuff, but also elimination of problems without being corporate about it and bestowing from on high how do you get that kind of problem elimination complexity elimination culture yeah so um very often when there is loads of work to be done uh or we're growing at a really fast rate uh the organizations um think that we need to recruit more people uh we need to make somebody responsible um and what they're doing unknowingly um is growing into a very hierarchical business mm -hmm. so uh, one of the uh things that we actually teach organizations is how to and we hear that a lot is how to empower your teams how to empower your people because we are often treat our people as sort of resources um saying you know one person can be on one project or um we, we put them sort of in a bucket of how much they can do and we forget that actually we're very flexible beings we are uh, capable of learning um, and solving problems and it's, it then becomes um the, the focus should always be on your people how can i develop um my people in solving really complex problems and you uh, at the top level your managers will not always have um the vision or the answer for it so it's just about creating a structure of i would almost say mini mini businesses within your organization that are specialized in a certain end-to-end -end process um, that can help you um solve that problem so uh, here is an example you want to you just mentioned crm system um uh, crm system depends on the size of your organization it can be a big project it can it can it can take a year it can take you two years how long you want to do that um but we 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 skin that problem so essentially we understand what is it that our customers would like to have tomorrow that they're not getting today and how can we solve that problem uh, uh then you solve that problem you test that problem uh, essentially that's your experiment so just to summarize what i just said so it's, a, it's about empowering your people giving the people the 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 um, the opportunity to solve those problems for you rather mm -hmm. than thinking there is a tech that can, that mm -hmm. can automate uh, don't just think about okay let's hire more people and let's make you know, don't uh, try to refrain from building a very rigid structure within your organization. Mm -hmm. People are responsible for X, Y, Z. Um, again, work more in teams, empower your teams. Um, yeah. It's interesting, so it's interesting you say that because I I work with a company that uh, helps companies optimize um, supply chains, and very often the supply chain itself, you know, the the warehousing, the procurement the um, marketing, the uh, distribution, all of these departments operate in silos. And I was talking to them, and uh, I think I'm going to do a podcast with one of the people from the company. 
And he said to me that one of the things that organizations generally do is one department tries to solve a problem, solves it for themselves, but creates another one for another department. Yeah. And then the other department tries to solve it by doing something else, which creates a problem somewhere else. And, and, and in one scenario saying to me about department A decides to cut costs. So they change the way they work to reduce costs. But inadvertently, Department B then has increased costs because now they have to hire an extra person to manage that complexity. Uh, and so that person now is providing new reports to Department C and Department C is now having to do extra work. And what happens is the saving in the silo becomes an additional cost in the business. Yeah, I, I really like um, how you've actually put this. Um, working... Every single organization I've worked with so far, silos um, is a problem uh, for everyone. And this is why there are, this is what I refer to as a traditional way of working. You know, you, you, you put accountants together, you put marketing people together, you put salespeople together, and then they optimize the sales process, but that creates more work for the marketing department or for tech or whatever it is. Um, so the new way of working um, would be that you see with more agile organizations, you know, such as uh, Spotify and, and Facebook and sort of that we see as examples of how um, of agile way is working is essentially creating cross-functional teams. So a team should be um, should be able to solve a problem that's end-to-end. -end. And what does end-to-end -end mean? It means that they start off and they solve that problem for the actual customer. Because even when you're trying to save costs and optimize your invoicing process, this is still adding value to the customer. So it is about grouping the people together. So in that process, for example, if I was to put this together just on top of my head, you have somebody from accounting because they know how it work, how the accounting system works. You have somebody from sales because eventually it's their customer. You have somebody from marketing and you have to tech people. So this is a cross-functional team. And eventually when you say, when you have a problem, you say um, it takes way too long for our customers to pay our invoices and you give that problem to the team. Then because they are in within that team, there's so many, there's so much expertise. They'll come up with a potential solution. Again, I say potential because we don't know until we test. Mm -hmm. Put something together in a small batch um whether that's okay well, let's try and apply this quick fix they launch this and they look at the metrics is mm -hmm. this working has that particular process end-to-end -end process actually improved what you know can we see improvement in sales can we see an improvement in uh, in accounting and all of those uh, metrics put together um so yeah that's that's and then then the then the the solution is is the solution is collectively. that the what you've then realized okay you can see you've done your uh you've added value to the customer the mm -hmm. solution is just uh was uh, put together really quickly and it's maybe from on a back end point from a from a developer's point of view it's not very scalable uh, but you now realize that this is a requirement because it's actually optimized your um, your your efficiency. It's it's almost like um, um, starting with a blank paper, isn't it? It's like going, this is the problem. Marketing, sales, tech, all of these people come in and it's like, how do we get the best solution for this? Bearing in mind, if we do this, this happens to sales, this happens to, and you find a solution that, is the least friction in the whole process. If it works like, like a field test, I call it with writing content, field testing, you post it and see what happens, post it, see what happens, and then learn from it and improve. It's kind of the same model. Sit everybody down, find an idea, see if it works, do a little field test. Oh, that could work. And then you could build some infrastructure technology to make it, make it scale. Right. Absolutely. That's that's the way you eliminate silos by getting by getting the right people to work on a problem rather than on a specified solution. Whereas if you had, say, the finance department work on it, they would work it on it. 
well, let's give you an example. Uh, sales de finance department could work on reducing the uh, debtor days, for an example, but actually annoy a load of customers at the same time. Yeah. This is the sort of problems you get uh, by working in silos. Whereas you could have a, a system, you know, uh, whereby finance does their bit, sales does their bit, and you eliminate the debtor days without annoying the customers. Yeah, you should always aim to, to apply course functionality, first of all, to your product development functions. And I'm not talking just about tech. So how many um, departments are involved in producing your service or, or working on the products or product development function that that should be your first step to um, create cross functionality and 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 and, and um, break down the hierarchies um, and empower your teams that is also our first um when we work with organizations on their transformation journey um, that is where we uh, add value and where we work the most with them and how do you get i'm just reminded of like <laughs> i don't know whether you remember this but I think it was the late 90s or maybe the early 2000s. The NHS decided to launch your online account so you could have your health online and they digitized. And they spent about eight billion pounds on this system, launched it on the first day and it collapsed. <laughs> Yeah. Do you remember? I don't know whether you heard about this. The, but... Dean, let's not uh, the, the, let's not talk about public services. Uh, it gets me uh, very, very um, uh, frustrated by how much money uh, we are spending on um, on on tech for our government, um, where it could be done in a much more efficient way and we keep mm -hmm. outsourcing it and we don't try to build an internal function where we where we actually implement that uh, mentality of experimentation let's see what our customers need um so yeah there, there's there, there's a lot of work to be done there let me put it this way that that kind of cross functionality or, or collaboration between departments in that way yeah that's quite a culture change you have to make in the way people work <laughs> Because often in a in an organization that's quite hierarchical, people can become quite defensive of their little patch. How how have you dealt with that kind of kind of protectionism within silos? Yeah. I mean, there is no a nice way of doing it. Um, it is always gonna upset people. And if you are um if you want to make change you're going to have to face the facts that some people will not like it because this is how they've been working. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something you're going to have to accept. And uh, some people might think the innovation might cost them their job, right? The innovation might cost them their job. Suddenly their job spec completely changes. They've been, you know, they've used something in a certain way and it's been working. Why do I need to change now? And, and, and the thing is all, all of this frustration um, is quite normal. Um, mm -hmm. All these emotions are quite normal. And to be fair, Dean, probably you and I, if we're, uh, some things we've been doing for 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 a long time, and suddenly somebody comes along and says, "Look, you, you know, you can do it in a different way." The uh, depended on how they say it, but you know, it's very natural to uh, initially feel mm -hmm. a little bit of resistance. Um, mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that, and it is about managing that. Um, so you have to have a good communication plan uh, for how you're going to manage those feelings. Uh, you're just going to have to, uh, whether you do this as a per department, per team, or you do it organization uh, wide. That's just going to depend uh, per per. Uh, Per business, mm -hmm. uh, what's going to be the best approach? So um, we've done it on uh, where we've looked at. Okay, what department can we make the most impact on? It's in which department feels the most pain. Let's start with that. Um, then, as that experiment is successful, you can see people are happier. Um, other departments naturally want to know what's going on. I want to do that. I mm -hmm. want to work uh, less and be more productive. You know th those kind of things. So and, there, there's different approaches. And I suppose the the option of going too drastic, too quick. I mean, the way you're suggesting it is is simple straightforward steps um that drive little steps and little steps towards improvement rather than like with the software development scenario they try and build it and launch it in one go and then realize there's a whole load of flaws with it it is baby steps because there is a danger if you try and 
you know, affect too much business transformation to make you like the odd thing about life is the more, if you do something to an excess, it actually causes the problem that you were trying to avoid. In other words, in order to digitally transform or to affect a business transformation, you go too far too fast and actually can't deliver the transformation or actually go backwards into the trans go backwards and become more uh, yeah. cumbersome as an organization. You can break right. people's spirits going too quickly. Yeah, no, absolutely. It is about making uh, small steps, uh, working in small batches, uh, understanding, getting the feedback, acting upon the feedback. Um, and also you want your transformation to be sustainable. You can make a change today. You can overhaul everything fairly quickly. But is this sustainable? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what's going to be the the, 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 the difference uh, between a successful transformation and not. And as you do it in smaller steps and you, you, you implement new ways of working, there will be people, as we call them, change agents. People are going to be very excited about it. And those are almost the people that you want to um, create that mm -hmm. are going to continue um, with the uh, with the enthusiasm and 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 positivity, and people will just uh, well, they'll just like that, and then that's how it spreads, right? You're, you're building an uh, innovation innovators. Yeah. Instead of at the top going, we need to innovate this business. What you're doing is empowering everybody to be an innovator, not in the sense that you know you're all over the show, but but actually to channel that innovation into efficiency. Absolutely. And into better outcomes for customers, better business, the works. It's like it's it's funny yeah. why people haven't been doing this for a long time. Why is it something that's only come out recently? Is because um, we've realised the world has changed, and and many many businesses it was about process, which is still about process, but it was about process and control, and then yeah. you reach a point where actually you have to you have to function differently you need processes you need control but because of the speed the world is working at when we work with fax machines it didn't matter right you could be as slow as you wanted to be because the world turns so slow yeah but now it's like no no somebody's just launched a startup and they've just acquired a million customers and now we can't rest on our laurels we got to move guys now Absolutely. And in, in my, in, from my perspective, this is exactly what has caused this, is that organizations that have been very comfortable and have had loads of mar market um, share, now suddenly their competition comes out of a startup that's only been going for about a year. But what the difference is, is that the startups have this uh, experimentation mindset embedded. They don't have a lot of budget. They need to start small, build small, test, and iterate from then on. So it's really built into how how they work and then suddenly it, it's not about how long you've been on the market it's about how quickly you can learn and implement those changes mm -hmm. and that's why now it doesn't matter if you are um if you've got ten thousand employees twenty thousand employees you could be gone next year if you don't learn to experiment you don't change anybody remember skype <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean there is quite a few uh, uh companies uh, that um we're on the on the high street only five years ago that are now gone. Yeah, it's just fascinating with the Skype story because it's like Skype was tech and Skype really, you know, Zoom was around, but Skype really owned the market quite a bit. And then suddenly around the pandemic, Zoom just went. Yeah. And like, who even uses Skype now? Yeah. No, you're right, but uh, I think uh, there is the, the 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 issue for organisations is there is a lot of literature out there. There's loads of knowledge um, on how. Uh, you know, on all these frameworks, on empowering your teams and culture change and all of that. Um, but there is still not quite enough practical examples on how we've done it effectively. There's big companies that are trying and doing that. Some of them are successful, just again, depends how you define success, um, but large organizations are puzzled. How do I transition um, mm -hmm. from working, how I've been working for the past 20 years and seeing my 
my product and services in a certain way? How do I reimagine? Mm-hmm. How do I rebuild essentially my value chain from scratch? And there's not, and you know, I wish I could just come on here and say, there you go, step number one, two, three, four. If you do that, I can guarantee your it's going to happen for you. But it's not the case. Everybody- it would be Im- immature. It would be immature for an organisation to think there is a, you know, a ten step process for some of this stuff because I I. I've always, one of my little mottos I use here is because we came from me being just Dean and, you know, we built from just Dean. So all the systems have been Dean systems, which some of them weren't very good. And as people came in, they changed it. But I said to everybody, you know, we're going to have to build the plane whilst we're flying it. Yeah. But in your scenario, I think, a lot of your clients that you're helping them with is rebuild the plane whilst flying it. Uh, yes, uh, rebuild the engine while flying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it is really scary. Uh, there is loads of risk involved, and mm-hmm. you know what's going to happen to my plane. Uh, maybe it's gonna. It's not even going to look like a plane. Uh, how am I going to navigate that plane? Uh, mm-hmm. So it's just that unknown and that uncertainty. Um, first of all, not knowing where you're going into and how to get there is it, really scary to do. Yeah. No, I think I think uh, I think this is you know this has almost become you know digital transformation for me. Before we were talking properly, and not just today in previous, it was always for me was a buzzword for a clever IT technical person. But the more I've spoke to you, the more I see that this is actually, it's an industry in itself. It's like change management. It is change management. It's like your business is here, it's selling this and it's doing this and you're trying to future proof it and stay competitive, stay where the market is and that requires you to adapt and persist, persistently and consistently adapt. And that is, for me, whilst there is a tech angle to that, for me, that is, that's an industry in itself. The art of how do you keep the business functioning and safely remodel it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, there is. Uh, so you can you hear lots about agile transformation and digital transformation, but in essence, what you're doing is just you transforming your business. So the right term for this is business transformation. Um, I think agility talks more about the ways of working, your culture and people, uh, whereas digital is how do you leverage technology? And it just happens the way that. Technology nowadays is what's going to leverage, um, you know, our transformation. But essentially, you are completely reimagining how your business is going to work. Yeah, which is um, is something we all have to live with because the world keeps spinning, even if we don't want it to. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Anna, this has been fantastic, really insightful. Where, um, where's the best place for people to reach you if they're considering a project and want to make sure that they do it in the right way? Uh, I would say there's two ways. There is a website you can have a look at. Uh, the email address is on there, or just feel free to link to send me a message on LinkedIn. So, uh, w- uh, website address is digitaldom. dot io. dot io. Digitaldom. dot io, and connect with you on LinkedIn is awesome. Drop you a message on there. Yeah, Anna, you've been a star. Thank you for coming on. Totally unscripted. I think you'll agree she's been fantastic. Um. And Anna, I look forward to catching up again soon because this was really interesting. I'd really love to hear some more insights on where the world's going next time as well. Um, So thank you so much.